Welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black, my co-host, Stephen Gillespie. And joining us, man, I, I keep saying April is a huge month for us to draft deeper. And we're going to keep on rolling, talking about not my guys, not necessarily Steven's guys, but their guys. Hosting guests, bringing a different sort of dimension to when we talk about prospects. We want to highlight guys who are not being valued enough on other people's boards, maybe who are under the radar being slept on even within the draft of bowl conversation, not necessarily within a top 30 first round conversation. That's why I'm excited to have on somebody who I've been following him on Twitter for quite a while. And I know Steven has already collaborated with him on some excellent work. This man actually, he, he's not just tweeting out his scouting reports anymore. He's doing some work with NBA draft junkies. If you listen to this podcast, you know, the name Raphael Barley, you know, the website, NBA draft junkies, Erson, the mirror, Erson, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm a loyal listener to this show. And to be on myself, it's a huge honor, man. Again, thanks for having me on the show. No, first of all, thank you for helping me before we started recording to make sure I didn't botch your name. Because I, <laughs> no, I, I absolutely, okay. I do that every time we talk about certain prospects on this podcast. I can assure you that I've already butchered names in the past. Um, nobody can still figure out whether it's Jeremy Suhan or Sohan and no, nobody can figure that one out either. So I'm trying to avoid as much controversy in the namespace as possible. So you were a, a kind soul to, to help educate me a little bit, first and foremost, Erson. But listen, I really appreciate having you on the pod. I love talking to different people and I want to make sure that I include as many people in this space as possible because it is such a wide open space. This game is a global game first and foremost, but it's also one where we need to make sure different opinions are had. It's why I've wanted Steven to join me on this podcast because him and I do have different opinions, but that also helps open up the discussion space. And it also helps when we bring up some of quote unquote, your guys, Arison, because that means we're probably not going to be talking about just the top three guys, podcast to podcast. We're going to branch out, we're going to bring some different names into the conversation. And I'm pleased to report We've really only talked about the guy who we'll start off with at length on this podcast. Um, the other three names, Erickson, that, that you have that you're going to bring to the table for us, we really haven't discussed them this year. We've discussed them previously, but yeah. not really at all this year. So that's why I'm so excited to jump in. And I want your thoughts. I want you to give me a few sales pitches because we are talking about some guys that I'm not high on, but you do see something in them. And that's why... We, we, we need to, to dive right in. We got we to jump right into this. So we'll, we'll start with a guy who I think all three of us are, are probably in alignment on as being a first round prospect. And that would be Marshawn Beauchamp out of the G League. Mm -hmm. He's on the older side for a draft prospect. Technically, he is 21 years old. He's had a very, very interesting path to where he's at right now with the G League night. I know Rashad Phillips, when, when Steven and I hosted him on this podcast, we talked about Marjan yep. Lopez, prospects who have unique paths in general. Um, did get to play 22 games with the G League Ignite, 15.1 points per game, uh, shot 53.3% from the field, which is always encouraging. The three-point number I think we'd expect a little more from as well as the free throw percentage. But you're not necessarily asking to be a volume three-point shooter, right? It's more of, He'll, he'll take and make the shots that come to him when they're there. But what you're really valuing in his game, and I'll let you get into plenty of it, Erickson. I mean, the thing that really has stuck out to me is, I, in my opinion, I think he's the best transition wing in this class offensively. Um, that, that debate can open up depending on how you categorize Tari Eason. Uh, I would categorize him more as a forward if you do have him as more of like a 3-2 a, a type of wing. If you think he can get there with some of his ball skills, then – yeah, I, I can see the debate going either way, but if you're classifying him as a forward, Beauchamp does so much for you in transition that I love. He always leaks out early. He's very aware of what's going on around him. He fills lanes correctly. Then you throw in what he can do in a half court as a cutter when he's hitting open jump shots. And then defensively, man, the guy, the guy's a menace. Um, the guy's a menace on the ball. He really traps well, forces turnovers, and to, to get himself as well as his team out in transition where he's best served. Um, so obviously there are things you can nitpick about his game, but 
for the most part, for what he is in this draft class, I think he should absolutely be valued as somebody in, in the top 20, 25 range. So hope I didn't steal any of your thunder, my friend, on, on <laughs> why you like him. Um, but Erison, why why did you want to bring him up as one of, quote, unquote, your guys? Why do you think he's being sucked on a little bit? I think if you look at his game, I think it's mostly his off-ball skills that really setting him apart, you know? In the NBA, you have those off-ball players, low-usage players, who are promising to be high-tier role players. I think Marshall and Bochamp are exactly one of those guys. You mentioned the 15.1 points per game, and uh, almost 10 points of those are in the paint. And what he's doing very well is he's a great cutter. He knows when mm-hmm. you know the back door is open, he's going for the, for the cut. And also, he's making some great off-ball movement as well, getting in his spots. And what I like about him the most is that despite the, the high age, because he basically set out the year before he joined Ignite, but overall, if you look at this game, he's going to give you offense at the paint. He's going to get to his spots, whether it's on the ball, making plays off the bounce himself. He doesn't do that quite often. Mm-hmm. But the biggest value is his off-ball movement, making cuts to the rim, and the passer finding him for the open lane at the rim. You know, So at the Ignite, I think if you look at their team, the spacing is not very good. So the three-point shooting numbers for Hardy, for Beauchamp, you know, for Daniels, don't tell the whole story. Or Daniels mm-hmm. needs to feel the mood. But if you focus on Marsha and Bochamp, I think he's not going to project to be a shooter at the NBA, but mostly a guy who's going to make some good off-ball plays. I think he's a, he's a good screener. You can use him in the pick and roll. And at the end of the day, he's going to get his spots at the, at the rim, basically fair cuts. And if you look at some teams that can might use his help, because every team needs a great on-ball defender, I think he's a great lockdown defender. And he can really, you know, he's a menace as defense, as you really said. But the biggest value I see for him is a guy that can put up a silent 12 points a game on every given night, basically from five, six attempts at the rim. He's going to shoot some open threes if he gets one. And he's a low-usage guy who's mostly going to make off-ball plays on both ends of the court. Whether it's on defense, you know, guarding the best the best wing at that moment, because I really think he's at not at the beginning, but I think in in a few years down the stretch, he will be an NBA starting caliber player. I truly believe that because at the ignite from the games that I've seen, basically is because of the, when the showcase when he really had a strong start to the season at the G League ignite, where he didn't really play as good as he did at the showcase, but the things I put out was really those off-ball plays. It's an excellent cutter to the rim. He's making some great off-ball plays on, on offense, constantly moving. So he's spacing the floor for other guys as well. And those cuts to the rim, that's what you're buying with Marshawn Bochamp. The guy who's scoring 15 points in the G League night on very high efficiency, despite them being a bad offensive team. But he's getting his spots, and he doesn't need so too many attempts to get his points, you know. So to translate this game to the NBA, I truly believe that he'll be some of those high tier role players, you know, the, the the comparison I made for him, but that's furthermore down his career, is the role that Iguodala had at the Warriors. I think he's a great defender, a guy who doesn't need too many reps on offense to get his points. He's truly a team player, you know. But if you look at his profile, he had four high schools. He basically set out here before he joined Ignite. Those things don't help him in his draft stock. I was 21 years old at the draft. So the NBA executive will value some younger players than him. But the main reason I have him as a, you know, at the back end of the lottery in my board is that he's going to give you those off-ball plays, lockdown defense, excellent cutter, and an excellent finisher at the rim. That's what you're buying with Marshawn Bochamp. I love it. And Steven, I don't know where you currently have Bochamp right now. I know our boards, I mean, hell, they, they fluctuate week to week at this point. Like who, who knows where I'm going to have one guy the next week. I, I did have him as like a back end lottery talent at one point. I, I think when I come back to it, I'll be curious to get some of your thoughts, Stephen. But when I come back to it, I think the only reason why he slid down my board is really because there are more interesting perimeter bets, in my opinion, to make on guys who have maybe boosted their stock and helped themselves. Like Malachi Brandon is probably one of like the first guys that comes to mind. Like players like that who have pushed themselves into the conversation, who project as better shooters and overall better self creators from the more traditional sense in terms of being on the ball handling those guys I think have propped themselves up and have done themselves favors that that's why he's he's fallen a little bit to to me but where do you have Beauchamp right now what do you think about Erickson's valuation on 
Well, first off, I, I like Erickson's uh, evaluation a lot. You know, I think that he touched on a lot of the major talking points that a lot of us are probably going to share on Beauchamp to begin with. Right now, I have him at 26. And I mean, he's in that same range as like a Kendall Brown and Ishmael Kamigate, a Kennedy Chandler and a Ty Ty Washington. So I feel pretty comfortable where I have a lot of my first round guys. But I mean, there could be some movement in and, you know, in and out, depending on who's going to declare, you know, what they look like at their combine, things like that. And the one thing that I really think that Beauchamp's going to do, I think that he's going to test out very well at a combine because NBA teams already have access to a lot of his measurables and everything. That's one of the great things about the Ignite is that how accessible players are to NBA teams and things like that. And we know that they're running NBA schemes where we know that they're going up against NBA level competition. The three point, uh, you know, arc is set to an NBA three already. So, you know, our, our buddy Maxwell, you know, Baumbach has already brought up that one of the things that we got to consider when we look at how players like a Jaden Hardy or a Marjan Beauchamp do when they shoot from deep is take into account that they're seeing an uptick in competition also along with a longer floor. So it might take them a season or so to grow custom to the, to the range now. But one of the things that Urson brought up that I really liked was Beauchamp's defense. You know, he, he's kind of been like that defensive stalwart all season long. Urson, I wanted to ask you, you know, coming up through the system that he did, you, you mentioned that some teams might hold it against him that he had kind of a strange route. But I, I think that NBA teams also could talk about that resiliency, you know, the fact that he's gone through and seen some stuff and, you know, handled his process a little bit differently. You mentioned the high schools. You mentioned the fact that he, you know, sat out a season. Do you think that an NBA team could talk themselves into saying like, all right, we're getting a grown man here. We're a contending team probably at the back half of the first round. Do you think that they can look at that kind of path that Bochamp took and take stock in that as a good thing? Yeah, I do, because I think it's showing his dedication to the game because he has a tough route before he came to the Ignite, but he's making the most of the opportunities that he's getting. So he played 22 games. I think the, the last few games I read somewhere that they basically pull him out to not risk an injury. Yeah. But yeah, the rough route. Everyone's after high school, you go to college, and after that you declare for the NBA. And that's your shot, but he had a really tough route for high schools. Maybe you have some problems there. So that really shows his dedication to the game to me that he's bounced back at the Ignite and really set himself as a legit NBA prospect, you know, that teams have to consider. And of course, you have some guys in every draft class that's going to give you some off-court problems. Not to, to mention that he's going to give you one, but for example, Kevin Porter Jr. is another one. He was picked with uh, almost, I think, the 30th pick. But he was way more talented because of that. But yeah. his off-ball problems, his off-court problems really cost him some draft stock. And I think Marshall Bochamp could face the same destiny, destiny as him. But I think if you look at his overall game, how he's developed from game one to, to the last game that he played, that's progression. And he had a really tough path. And I think you have to give him a lot of credit that he bounced back, you know, acted as a real professional to prepare for his NBA journey at Ignite. So I think NBA teams should take that as a positive rather than as a negative. But only, I think the age might hurt them, but the whole process made sense to me. Yeah, and if you also look, too, at the way that the Ignite season started, we expected a lot of things out of Jaden Hardy. The one constant that this team always kind of had was Bochamp. You know, even though that he wasn't really a great yeah. shooter, he was always there on that team as a scorer. So, you know, you're looking at a player that you touched on already, Erson, that a guy who can cut, a guy who can handle the ball a little bit, it's like he's already playing his NBA role for the Ignite when we talk about some of these other guys. You know, Michael Foster, we know, is going to get a lot of touches in the paint, and he takes away a lot of that that driving and, and dishing ability that, you know, guys like Daniels and Hardy want to have a little bit. But Bochamp was able to do that early on in the season, too. So I'm glad to see that it's not just my eye seeing that a little bit, you know, that Bochamp – came in already early in the season was able to contribute at a high end at the beginning and it just kind of reverted back to a role that I think is going to be able to benefit him at the next level yeah exactly Harrison the one thing that that stood out to me I actually I'll say two things that stood out to me when I saw him in person was number one you talked about his level of professionalism that he's shown and, and I would 100% agree with that when I saw him on the court with his teammates 
I could tell that he was very receptive to anything that they were talking to him about when they were trying to communicate with him. He was very heads up. He was very aware. And then it comes back to what I saw off the court as well. When he was talking with other coaches, he, he seemed like he was very self-aware. If he made a mistake, he was willing to own it, which uh, I will say in that game, he really didn't make too many mistakes to my eyes. I think that game that despite them getting beaten pretty badly by Delaware, I think he actually had a pretty good performance in that one. I really didn't see too many mistakes for him. But the other thing that I saw, not just in that game, Harrison, but really as the season went on, he started to find some rhythm as a pull-up jump shooter. Um, in, in transition, yep. he would get inside the arc, go to some of those one, two dribble pull-ups, and he would find so much of a comfort level in those shots. His balance is good. He gets up, gets good elevation on his jump shot to begin with, but he's really balanced. He's poised, he's composed. I, I think he wants to take and make more of those shots. I think he wants that to be in his arsenal, um, not just something that he's, he's trying to show scouts, even though it might not be fully ready to be part of his game. I, th I think it's something that you can tell he's really worked on. And if that's a weapon that he can bring into the NBA, that I think is the most interesting point when we start talking about taking him inside the top 20 and really pushing up into that lottery conversation. Do you, do you think do you think that part of his jump shot is going to come around for him and, and keep being a weapon for him at the NBA level? Do you think he's just going to be looked at as like a catch and shoot corner three kind of guy? No, well, I think he's going to do mainly both because he, as you said, he does create off the bounce a little bit. He doesn't get really a lot of those on ball reps. Yep. So he has really been showcasing the whole package, but especially later on in the season, the three point shot really was promising because yep. We saw a trend where he was really affected at the restricted area in the beginning of the G League Ignite season. And it slowly declined and he changed his shot diet a bit. So he was checking more of those of jumpers where he's catch and shoot or he basically made a play of himself and he pull up from the mid range or from three. I think the, the percentage doesn't tell the whole story and he's not an efficient three point shooter, but I think that's something that down the stretch that can really happen at the NBA level. Because with the NBA spacing, because I think with the G League Ignite spacing, the difference is it wasn't really good. So the three-point percentage, you don't tell the whole story. But if he goes to a team that will allow him to get some open looks from three, I think you're going to drain them. Because if you look at the shot diet, it's mainly going to be attack, attacking the rim, driving, cutting, and finishing at the rim. But those three-point shooters, I think he really has a couple of those attempts per game in the NBA as well. Uh, if he shoots about 35 to 36% on those, that's sufficient, I think, with the defense, the potential two-way scoring option on him, because I wasn't really impressed with his mid-range game. I think it was really too much forced if he doesn't find an entry to the rim, but he was basically pulling up sometimes. I saw a few possessions of these that really didn't really, you know, convince me that he was able to drain those. But the three-point shot looked promising, because the shooting stroke looks good. He doesn't have a broken shot. I think the release is good as well, but it's mainly getting those looks, you know, because he hasn't really gotten enough of those looks at the G League Ignite for the whole season to really showcase a balanced three-point three point shooting. And as you talked about, I mean, he's going to get the majority of his points in transition. Um, and and yeah. he is he is blazing quick in the open court. He he was definitely the G League Ignite's best athlete, I, I think, by a relative mile. Um, when you factor in speed, quickness, vertical pop, I mean, he, he, he does some things athletically that, that really set him apart and, and help to cement more of his case as a first round prospect amongst his peers. I think before the season started, it was a real question of if he could be a first rounder, then once the G League Ignite got through like their first portion of their schedule, then it was more factoring in, okay, he's a first rounder. It, it's a matter of, of where, not necessarily yeah. when. Um, so he definitely has helped himself this year. And I, I love stories like his and I wish him nothing but continued success as he truly does march on towards his NBA journey. O only has a few months before he hopefully gets drafted. So the, the not much longer to wait for him. Well, Nathan, now, real quick before we, we transition, I want to ask Urson, where do you have him like on your board right now? Like, obviously you're not, you don't have to be married to this opinion or anything right now, but as of today, where do you have where do you have Beauchamp? I think you said late lottery, right? Yeah, late lottery. I have him at fourteen. Late lottery, fourteen. Okay, right at the tail end. Awesome. And and like I said, I I I was definitely at that point at, at a certain month in the season. And it's really only been because of other guys propping themselves up why he's he's slid down my board a little bit. It's it's not to his detriment. He's only improved 
um, as the season has gone along. And, and I've been really impressed to see it. You kind of expect him to maintain a, a certain level of production given his yeah. age and the situation that he's in, but it's, it's any adjustment, any time a player is adjusting to a new level of competition, like the G league is no joke. And we've talked about that multiple times with a bunch of different guests on this podcast. It, it's no joke. You're going up against guys who are struggling to fight for a job in the NBA, let alone just make sure they're doing enough in their career right now to be able to provide for their families, put food on the table. It, it's a and I think, whole different environment. And I think too, we st- it's still relatively new for us to evaluate prospects in that environment at the same time that we're evaluating other international prospects and collegiate players too, right? Like we acknowledge that it's a bigger floor, it's an uptick in competition, but we're comparing their production at that level as opposed to probably maybe a step down or a half step down to these other leagues where we're evaluating prospects yeah. it's still a relatively new process to to evaluate them at the same time as these other guys that's not even the worst of it man we, we got I, I gotta sit here and try and decipher how young Montero's <laughs> play and, and dominic barlow and cocky and all those guys i gotta yep. translate how how they're going affect a, a game on an nba court but yeah the, i i think i've gotten much more comfortable the second year evaluating the G League Ignite team and really having a better feel of what they're trying to do in their program, how they're trying to coach these guys, and what kind of developmental tracks they're laying out for them in just one year to be able to showcase the right skills to NBA Correct. teams to, to be able to boost their draft stock. So it, it, it's been an interesting experiment. I, I think I think it's been a really positive one. I, I love yeah. what the Ignite team ended up doing last year. And despite some of the struggles with this team, because – they didn't have the same support systems in place for these young guys like they did last year. Like they don't have a point guard this year, like Jared Jack. I mean, Scoot Henderson really only came. He, he really only started to play like, well, like halfway yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. N- not the same level of, of point guards <laughs> like a Jared Jack um, no. or, or, or even even a Dacia Nix in, in some cases who, man, he's had some really good moments for, for, yeah. the, for the Houston Rockets. Um, and their G League team already. So, and also their off the court stuff that they provide the the team that we don't really get a chance to talk about a lot. You know the programs and you know the classes that they offer these guys for how they're supposed to be able to translate to the next level, like what to do with their money. You know, advertisements, all of that, all of that is such a cool concept behind the G League. There, so, what are, what are your thoughts on the on the G League Ignite program to to, to wrap up the convo on this one? I love it. I think last season was really tough for me to evaluate Knicks, Kuminga, and Green. Green hopefully stood out, but the the main positive for me is these guys are playing as pros from high school to the pros. Yep. There's a huge jump. And some of these guys are really early with their contributions. And some of the guys really took a long time. For example, Knicks, his shooting really led to him being undrafted, but he's really came back strong with Houston Rockets, you know? The Valley Vipers won the Western Conference right now, and he's really been balling out, and he really deserves that spot at Houston. And I think Kaminga, of course, he's going to be high tier role player for Warriors, but I truly think Jalen Green is going to be an NBA star one day. I even think he's going to be in also next season if he continues like this. So it's really positive that those guys, three guys, already are contributing to the NBA teams. So this helped their, the guys of this year as well. So Daniels, Bo Champ, Hardy playing in the same competition as them. So they basically get a bit of help from those three guys from last year as well, because the G League Ignite is no joke, as you said. It's a serious league against grown-ass men. Basically, they're very young, playing against guys who are 10 years older, more physical, etc. So I really like the G League Ignite program. I'm already looking forward to next season. I, I saw your tweet about Green, and I was kind of like doing a little fist pump in the background. I, I get it. I get Emilio Estevez. Yeah. I get in dangerous waters when it comes to me and Rockets Twitter. Okay. I, I start going uh, off the deep end and I'm like, I just started like retweeting five different things about Jalen Green and then Shen Goon throws a wicked pass. And I'm like, oh man, I, I got to get back to work here. But people <laughs> really did not like Shen Goon coming into the draft process. Yeah. And that blows my mind. Blows my mind. You, you, you know what, man? I, I kind of said last year during the draft process, you either saw it. Or you didn't. It, it really, really just came down to that. And for the people who saw it, I think we've been pretty heavily vindicated up to this yes. point during his <laughs> rookie year. Now, 
Shen Goon needs to figure out how to not foul out of every single game that he plays <laughs> Correct. In, uh, on defense. But one, I, I, I think once he can reasonably stay on the court for, for 30 minutes and not have to worry about picking up that last foul, I think he's only going to be that much more dangerous for Houston. And yeah, they got green. They got Knicks waiting in the wings. Usman Garuba has, has just barely scratched the surface as to how good he can be. In Josh Houston. Christopher. Yeah, Jake up. Yeah. yeah the, the, the Rockets. I did not get to watch as much Houston Rockets basketball this year as I would have liked to, but ne- next year I, I want to make sure I mix in much more NBA throughout the, the scouting cycle. And one of well, the, they're going to have teams, Chet Holmgren now. So, you know, Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Mr. Mock draft over here. We, we, we don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Man. Who, who the hell knows? So let's move into the second prospect that Erickson wanted to talk about. We'll, we'll stick in, in with, with the domestic scene a little bit. We'll talk college. We'll talk Jabari Walker, the Colorado forward. Listen, Erickson, I, 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 this is one of those three guys I really want your sales pitch on because I've, I've seen some really, really smart people who I respect in the basketball space have Jabari Walker as like a top 20, top 25 prospect. Um, even, even Chad Ford before, um, he, he bid his, his farewell during his farewell tour. I think he had some really positive things to say about Jabari Walker as well. He is one prospect. I have not been able to come around to really liking him a ton. I, I understand it. I get the physical tools, six, eight, 200 pounds, um, shoots a decent percentage from the field when the three point shot goes in. Now, all of a sudden this game really starts to come together, but that shot, the shot's not consistent for him. And I think that's really hurt his draft stock in a lot of different respects. And the other part of it too is at least on the offensive end, he's a little stiff and he's not the most coordinated um, player when it comes to handling the basketball and doing a lot off the bounce in the half court. He's much more of a role man, a play finisher and kind of like an open shoot guy. And I guess if that's all you need him to do, and then you also factor in what he does do on the defensive end, which I really don't have many negatives to say about him defensively, that's when we start talking about, well, shouldn't he be more highly valued a- a- as a role player? I just, I just haven't been fully sold on the offense and how it's going to translate to the NBA, but maybe you have some, some different thoughts, Erickson, as, as him being one of your more undervalued guys. So w- why do you think Jabari Walker has been a little undervalued in this process? Where do you have him? I have him as an early second round pick. I think that's the perfect value to get for him. But as on the defensive end, I think he's NBA ready already. As you said, there's not a lot of negative to say about him. I think he's a really smart son of a professional basketball player. The basketball IQ and that has really comes together when he's playing, you know, this season. I think on the defensive end, he has shown a lot of those impressive stuff that you're going to make you think about, hey, this guy is, is really good. I think for every second unit that needs defensive stops, that needs to guard the opposing wing or the forward. Jabari Walker is your guy. But I agree on the offensive end. It's not really been consistent. He looks a little bit, not a little bit silly, but a little bit yeah, stiff, as you say, because he doesn't really handle the ball that well. Mm-hmm. But he does kind of, you know, create his own offense inside the arc. I've seen a couple of plays where he gets downhill and, you know, finishes strong at the rim. I've also seen at the beginning of the season that he gained a lot of muscle compared to last season. That he's really yep. built on his his body. So that's a big positive. And he's trying to translate that game to the next to the next level. You know, of course, it's for him. It's a new environment, getting stronger, changing your game. The three-point shot, I think the percentage is, is good, but it doesn't tell the whole story because I agree. He's not, for me, he's not a good three-point shooter yet, but he, he has shown he can drain a couple of those open ones, but that's basically every college player doing that. So that's not setting it apart from the rest. But the part that's on the value for me is Another one. I'm really, I have a weakness for those guys who are already good at defense, you know. So, and with Jabari Walker, if you draft him in the early second round, you get a good guy on defense that can give you good stops and can give you efficient offense at the other end, you know. Because I think his ceiling, I don't know not to put the ceiling too early on a guy like that, but he's going to be a good role player. The eighth or ninth option on an NBA team, a good second round pick. The value is okay there, you know. So, but the underrated part for me is actually the NBA body, being NBA ready, and a lot of tools to work with because he's in the second year. He's 19 years old still, so the age factor is definitely in his advantage. And, of course, I think the basketball IQ is really what's setting him apart. 
He's a good, really good screener. I think he can make give you a lot of variety in the offense as a Roman, but also as you know, as a pick and pop shooter. You know, if he really gets to get better at the three point shot at the next level, a few years down the stretch, he's going to give you a lot of good offense from the bench, and also give you some good defense. You know, he's not going to be a negative value on any team. That's something I truly believe in, and that's the part where I think he's a little bit underrated. I don't have him in my first round. I don't think he will get there either, but as an early second round pick, especially in a deep class like this, from in the, from the, the mindset of good role players, you know, because I think from 20 to 40 range, all of these guys are very close. But the thing that sets me apart that's kind of underrated for me, how he's a little bit underrated is, especially on the defensive end, and I think the shot's really fixable. I don't think he has a broken form, but it looks a bit funky, you know, so... Yeah, I don't, want to call okay. him a, I don't want to call him a bad shooter because it's not it's yeah. not like he only it's not like he shot like 34 percent on only like one attempt per game. He, he shot 34.6 percent on on over three attempts per game. So he was willing to, to take them when they were there for him. I wouldn't call him bad, just just inconsistent, I guess, would be yeah. the, the correct word to, to use with him because he'll have he'll have some games where he looks like he can't miss. And then he'll have some others where, you know, he, he's not exactly buying a bucket from outside. And that's what really messes with his percentages a lot. I think if he was more consistent, I'd be much more comfortable projecting him as a player who could provide more value from the perimeter. I, Erickson, I, I like that you brought up the point about the role man. And this is kind of where I would like to kick the conversation for, for Steven too, and get some of his thoughts because I do like, this is, this is a positive about Jabari. I do like to see when players numbers uptick in terms of synergy percentiles, when you factor in the yep. offensive play type, including passes, and that happens for him. Um, 88th percentile in isolation, including passes, 89th percentile in post-ups, including passes. Those are some really interesting numbers to see because it speaks to his decision-making in the half court. And so Steven, I guess if he's efficient scoring as a role man, right. Ultimately getting down low and then finishing that play once he gets there. Can you also throw in some of the short roll dimension as well and really unlock some of his passing ability there? Now, when you start to talk about a forward who adds that and who can also step out on the pick and pop, now we're talking about a, a pretty simple offensive role for him that, that also fills a, a large need for a lot of NBA teams. The, the pick and roll and the pick and pop is the most popular play type for, for NBA teams. Do you think he can fill more of that role? I wouldn't rule it out. Um, one thing that Urson brought up earlier is the bloodline that he has, you know, father, uh, former NBA player as well, a pretty successful one. So I don't want to rule it out. I'm a little bit lower on him than uh, Urson is. I have him as a late second and I've kind of fluctuated with having him, you know, being draft, you know, he's definitely in the draftable range. And I would say that anywhere from like 40 to 75, you can talk me into a guy being draftable right now. Um, but I do have a second round grade on him for now. One of the biggest reasons is because of the defense. He's actually a terrific rebounder, too. And if yep. you look at the Colorado offense, uh, you know, they feature a, a, a shooting big man. So when you have that, I think that opens it up for Walker to be a little bit more of that kind of let me work you, put my back to the basket, um, kind of take a couple dribbles, maybe reposition my back to the, you know, face the other way and try to get an up and under shot or something like that on a guy who's not really experience and on defending like a scoring four player like that um offensively though what we saw one, one thing that I think that kind of works to his benefit for those synergy statistics that you just talked about Nathan is the fact that albeit it does uptick when you include passes we didn't see a lot so how much of that is real like that's my question you know because he's not really asked to be a big playmaker for Colorado so if you uptick the the volume on that is that is that going to be correlation or causation? You know what I mean? Like, do we know that if you uptick that, that role for him, that it's going to remain a constant? I don't know if I necessarily buy that, but I do like his defense. One thing that I want to ask Erson about though, is that I think that we can fall in love with these guys who are kind of like toolsy combo forwards. But if we look at the history of the NBA of guys like a, you know, a Michael K. Gilchrist, if we look at a Stanley Johnson or a Rondé Hollis Jefferson, you know, players like that, who, are kind of three fours who are defensive minded, but they don't necessarily add a lot of, you know, passing or shooting, but they're just kind of like gutsy, you know, role players. We see a couple of these guys stick for a couple of seasons, but it's really difficult for those guys to really find a home 
Do you think that Walker has anything that he can add to his game to kind of help his staying power a little bit? Nah, I hit the nail on that. I think guys like Kid Gilchrist, he doesn't really work on his offense a couple of seasons. He was out of the league. Stanley Johnson, the same thing. He didn't really show that he can drain the point shot. He's out of the league a couple of years. Now he's back with the Lakers. He's shooting, he's showing some shoot flashes now later on in his career, but that's the reason why I have him as a second round pick because it's yeah. a huge risk, you know, because if the offense isn't there, a guy like Jabari Walker doesn't sustain the league a long time. The defense is okay, but it's not going to give you 15 years of NBA of an role player eventually for playoff contention. He will always be in the lower echelons, you know, be of the last guy on the bench on a team that doesn't really play to to make the players, you know. So that's a risk I see in this profile. That's why I have him as a second round pick, as an early second round pick. But again, I think the defense is already established. He has shown some shooting flashes. The shoot looks funny, but. That's, I'm going, that's why I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt because I think the whole package does make a lot of sense for, for teams that are looking to increase their depth in their second unit, you know. So that's why I think the value for a second-round pick, an early second-round pick, is granted for Jabari Walker because he, as Nathan said, the passing flash is already there. He didn't do a lot of those, but he had some plays with the best to the basket where he find the cutter or find the open man in the, in the corner, you know. So that's our... That, those are tools to for NBA teams to work on that gives you a little more insurance, you know, for, for betting on a guy like that in the early second round. I guess my last question, I, I would close out the conversation with Jabari Walker uh, with this, Erickson, is do you think he has some value in the NBA in time as like a small ball five? And do you think that's maybe a way for NBA teams to unlock him a little more creatively? Yeah, that could be one of the possibilities because with the 220 pounds, he has some good size. The NBA frame is there. I think he can hold his ground against, uh, you know, not the, the stronger NBA centers, but in, especially in the closer and the smaller lineup. I think that's where he finds some value as well. I think that I'm not a big fan of those small ball lineups because it really doesn't give you a lot of insurance at the five position. That's mainly the weak side of it, especially for teams that rely on shooting. I think he can be a factor that you can use it in the paint, you know, in a small lineup. But I don't think that's a good role for him in the NBA to be used like that. He has the frame, but especially that's not something that sets him apart because that's going to be said about a lot of those guys who are, you know, 6'8", 6'9", 220, has a, has a good frame. We have a lot of those guys in this class. I don't think that's something that sets him apart, to be honest. So let's move to... Another quote unquote big man who it, it, interesting because I wouldn't necessarily categorize him as somebody who I'm lumping in the conversation with like Mark Williams, Walker Kessler, Ishmael Kamagate, some of those guys who you're hearing a lot more often towards the, the back end of the first round, early second round. And in Williams's case, I mean, he's, he's really helped himself lately. Now, now we're talking about lottery with him. Yep. Um, Khalifa Jop is an interesting name, though, because he's come up more often with some of the ESPN guys. Like I know Schmitz and Gavoni have tweeted about him. I think they would love to value him as like a top 45-ish, top 50 prospect, which would certainly be higher than where I would have him right now. I think as a No Sons collective, we have him more in like that, that 70 to 80 range. So knocking on the door of being a draftable prospect this year, but not necessarily cementing himself as a guy who we're definitely running up to the podium, the draft with a second round pick. Um, so that's why I'm curious where you're at on him, Harrison, because I, I, I see it. I see the physical tools. He's 6'11", 231. He can finish easy plays. He rebounds the heck out of the ball. He can block shots. I, I wouldn't agree with people who would think he's heavy footed. I actually think his mobility mm. is a little bit of a strength for him. Um, he, he doesn't move awkwardly. He's not, he, he, he's not lumbering up the court like your more traditional big man. He, he, he looks really good when he moves, which is definitely a positive. My, my big concerns with him, Erson, and, and maybe you have different opinions on these. Number one, I don't think he reads the game at a high level. I think his processing speed is very slow and he reacts to things on the slow side, which is more, I think, the problem than, than his feet or his coordination. And number two, I don't like his hands. When, when we talk about big men, for me, and, and Rucker and I have talked about this before too, you got to check the hands box and you got to check the feet box. Definitely checks the feet box for me. 
and the coordination, the mobility factor, but the hands, I see him fumble in too many passes. I, he doesn't have the touch around the basket on some of those tougher finishes that I want to see from him. He can, he can, he can make the open lob or the open dunk. And he looks awesome when doing it because he springs up off the floor. He's a big man. He's enthusiastic when he throws it down. You see those highlight clips and you go, man, this, this is an NBA big man. But when you really dig in and you look at some of those finer characteristics that you want to see from an NBA big man who'd be fighting for a roster spot, those are some things that really stick out to me. And they're not always the most fixable when you get to the next level. So Maybe, maybe talk about some of those negatives that I pointed out, Arison, but really also to do, do me a favor, highlight the positives too, and then try to sell me more on, on why Jop should be a little more um, valued on, on my board and maybe be pushing into that second round conversation. Well, the reason I have actually, I'm so high on Khalifa for Jop is he checks a lot of boxes. As you said, he's all your lob threat. That's, I think, MBS cars is the first thing that they look at. 6'11". I don't have the official wingspan. I think it's a 7'2 or 7'3". But he gets up there, you know. So, And on the other hand, he's really, you know, he's playing more of those old-school back-to-basket kind of game. That's really kind of draft, hurt his draft. So you don't see a lot of that in the NBA. But the positive in that one for me, he's, he's nailed those mid-range jumpers. He has it already possessed in that jumper, you know. So there's a huge positive for teams that are looking for a big man who can potentially extend his range. I think he can do that. But I also agree about the processing speed, you know, because from the tape that I've seen, he is, it's always, it's, if, if it works, it's really impressive. But getting there is where he's, he's struggling, you know. So I think the hands, New Orleans Noel is the biggest uh, comparison for that, you know, having bad hands in the NBA that you don't catch it's a lot good, of It's not good, man. Passes, <laughs> it's not good at all. Nope. <laughs> because Especially think, it's a lot threat, right? Yeah. Because I've seen in a couple of games live from Gran Canaria. That's a team I follow a lot. Uh, Gran Canaria is really a talent. Great team. Sean Montero is currently on the contract. There. He's loaned out. You have another prospect, Alexander Bolshevovsky, is also yep. you know, in the NBA draft this year. So three prospects coming from the team, who is basically on a Spanish island, you know, so that's impressive. But I think the whole process for him makes sense. He checks a lot of those boxes. He can shoot from the mid-range. He has a turnaround fadeaway jumper as well. But in the paint, you know, that's what the, the difference between the international game, the NBA game really said come into play because in the NBA, you have the three-second rule. You don't have that in the NBA. And he's really sometimes stuck in the paint, you know, so because in Europe, you just play the big man under the paint and, you know, opposing smaller guards don't really test those guys out, you know. So offense at the rim becomes really harder for them because I think on the defensive end, that's where he really kind of throwing his way his potential because I think in the pick and roll defense, he's very good. I think he's, the process speed doesn't help him, but he's making good decisions, you know, because he, he has a slow first step, but his acceleration is quite well. I think he's a really fast guy despite being so big and he doesn't go over the screen a lot. He doesn't bet on those. He doesn't gamble. What he mostly does is he stay or, or, or he drops the coverage, you know, he just bet on the shooter missing it. But when a player goes to the rim, it says the block rate is good. I think he has some of those, you know, those standard NBA big man blocks, you know, at the rim, getting a, the smaller pain, letting him get past you and block him from behind. But he does show the whole package for me. But I think, Nathan, you already put out, if you talk about the negatives, the process of speed is a risk. The hands are not good. So if you have a, if you draft him for a team that's relying on ball movement, he's not a good guy to pick. But you're relying for a team that's, you know, playing a lot of those pick and roll plays as him as a Roman, that's where you find his value. I think he's an excellent pick and roll Roman. He's a natural screen setter. I think that's the part where most international big men have an advantage over the American big men is that most of those international guys are excellent screens, you know. That yeah, really you got to set better screens for some of those guys, though, because yeah. those guards are not as quick as NBA guards. They, no. they need no. a good screen setter to be able Very to get crafty. the they need. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's a great – that's actually – Paris, that's a fantastic point that you brought. You, you kind of need to be a good screen setter. Yeah, you need yeah. to be a good screener to set yourself apart, you know, especially in the NBA as an international big man. Because with all respect for the American big men, I think the World Cup really showed the problem with the American big man school, you know. You don't have a lot of, a lot of course, excellent screeners. I think Ben Adebayo is the one. But yeah. after that, it's really making me think, who's the second one, you know. That's why in all those, in all those, you know, pick and roll, that's how you say that, in all those, you know, assists, screen assists, 
that's why all yeah. these international big men are leading all the, the top 50s, you know, because they're excellent screeners. I think MBS scouts, when they're looking for a big man, that's the first thing they got to look at, you know, how how much of separation will they create with their screens? And that's where Khalifa job has a huge value, in my opinion. Mm. But the processing speed, they has, that those things are not helping him. So that's going to help him in his draft stock. But you have guys like Khalifa job in every NBA class, you know, every NBA draft class. I'm not going to act like he's an upper echelon of big man, but I'm very fair to say that mainly if him as a roller, as a screener, and on the defense band as a rim protector, that's where he finds his value. And that's why I have him as a late first round pick at the moment, because he's still a young guy, you know. He can you can still work him out. You play him in the G League, just like around Osman Garubad. You know, he doesn't really get a lot of reps with the Rockets yet. He's playing for the G League squad. He wants to play in the summer league next season for them. That's a huge positive. So an NBA team, for example, like the Knicks who don't have a good screener and rely a bit on those pick and roll offenses, that's hurt their offense this season a lot. A guy like Khalid Fajab can really help, you know, bring a team like that to the next level. It doesn't rely a lot of the, on ball movement, but mostly on making plays via pick and rolls. We have more of the old school game, Thibodeau likes to run, you know. And Knicks are just an example. There are a lot, a lot of other teams that can use Khalid Fajab's help. But I think the screening ability, that's why I really rank him high amongst the the bigs in this NBA draft class. No, that's a, I mean, that's a great point you bring up uh, about the Knicks. I know that's, that's your team. Arison, we're definitely going to talk about the Knicks toward, towards the end for a little bit. Got to get some thoughts from you, but that, that, that is a point too. They, they, they have guys who would much prefer to slip to the basket and are more focused on finishing the play than necessarily banging bodies on, on the screen and then making contact and sending a good hard screen. That's, and, and, and you're, you're speaking to my heart, by the way, I, I'd love, good screen setters as big man. So that now, now we're really talking my language. Um, that, that's definitely a positive to bring to the forefront. Before before I think Stephen might want to jump in here, I will just highlight I'm a terrible host. I did not start off the segment by telling everybody to go read Arison's scouting report on Khalifa Jop on mbhjunkies.com. Yes. You read that report, you're immediately going to click the follow button on Arison's Twitter profile. Yeah, I promise you, you it, is, it is that good. So definitely... Go check that out for more details that, that we may or may not keep getting into into the segment. But but go go ahead, Stephen. The floor is yours. Just had to plug my guest here. Well, I mean, it's, I'm glad that you did because I was about to do, and I'd hate to go behind <laughs> your back and, and, and plug Erson's work like our, that. Our guest, not even my guest. Our, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, man, I'm messing excuse up on, on multiple. No, I meant I didn't say our. I said my oh. guest. I didn't even say our guest. I'm, man, well, I'm, I'm really messing up tonight. You got to carry it's, me a little bit, Stephen. It's, it's, a, it's a day, Nathan. I understand the day that you've had, brother, but it's all good, man. That's why that's why we're here, right? That's why we got a co-host. Um, So, Erson, first off, Love the article that you posted on Khalif Ajap. And he's one of these guys that early on in the season before the college season started, I wanted to start like digging into some of these international guys. And there were a lot of plays where I'll put I'll put myself out here. I'll be transparent and vulnerable to the audience because, you know, I feel like we got a great following and, and they love us. So I saw a lot of comparisons early on in the season, just minor comparisons. I'm not saying step for step or that he's going to be this guy. But there was like a lot of Joel Embiid tendencies to Khalifa Jop's game. If you look at his post work, and Nathan, I think you'll appreciate this as a Sixers guy. If you watch like the post hop steps, if you look at, you know, like the up and unders passing out of the paint and things like that, how fluid he was, like once he actually started going, like it reminded me a little bit of like early Joel Embiid before he started like really expanding out and doing a lot of perimeter things. So I was really impressed by that. But there's also those times or some where I was watching him play and, you know, Grand Canaria, they play a lot of really talented teams. I'm pretty sure Paris Basquette and like Fortitude know or among some of those teams with other NBA level talent on their rosters as well. You know, he, he has a tendency kind of to play small a little bit, like he's six eleven, but he feels like sometimes he plays a little bit lower than that frame, but then he'll explode on other plays, right? Like on those like lob threats, screening, playing around the basket, he looks a little bigger, but it it's like he kind of shifts bodies almost, like where he plays a little bit smaller. Um, you talked about the fact that, you know, the screen setting, playing around the basket, defense, uh, you, you talked about the Knicks. One thing I think that kind of hurts him is that I think that in the NBA, he'll kind of exclusively be kind of like a drop coverage big man. And when you can only fit that scheme, I think that cuts down the number of teams that'll look to want to draft you because there are a lot of teams in the NBA that want like, 
switching versatile like can step out on the perimeter and guard big man so that kind of hurts him up a little bit um I have him 70 on my board right now I've kind of entertained him being like a tell-in second round guy because I think that some of those you know fin- the touch around the basket the kind of the, the post moves that he have I, I do value that but do you think that you know a team like what type of team do you think that's that could really benefit to have him on their roster, right? Like you touched on the Knicks, but I mean, there's other teams that got like aging big men, like the Milwaukee Bucks have and Brooke Lopez who struggled with injuries. You know, there's other players, you know, maybe the Utah Jazz are looking to trade Rudy Gobert in the off season from everything that we're hearing, right? Like, are, is there like a list of teams that you think that he would be able to like positively contribute for based on their scheme? Yeah, I do. I think if I look at the uh, Hornets, for example, that, that I think the first one that checks out, they desperately need a big man. And I totally agree about the fact, you know, as a drop and coverage big man in the NBA, in an NBA that relies on shooting, that's not yeah. a good combination at all. So that's kind of very, very draft talks hurt. But I also see the Portland Trailblazers as a positive comparison, you know, as a okay. Yusuf Nurkic type of guy, because I think the screen setting is very kind of, you know, He's not on Yusuf Nurkic's level, but he can get there. But the part where I think he has not really get the appreciation for his game is guarding guys in the perimeter. He can do it two, three positions in a row, but the fourth one is he's out, you know. So because okay. with a big body like that, I think I've seen a couple of plays where he's guarding the smaller guy in the perimeter. He's losing at the first step, but he's accelerating quite fast, getting back to the rim, you know. So. That's a part of his game that I wanted to hide out because I think he's not Bam at bio-ish at cutting at the perimeter, not nowhere close to that. But I think he can hold his ground, you know. And I think if I look at this game, I love the MB comparison because the footwork and the paint and the finishing yeah. there is really quite special with Khalifa Job. That's what really sets him apart compared to some other of those international big men, like you know, for example, Ibu Baji, for example, mm-hmm. or some other guys. But he has a lot of learning to do. And a team that's going to draft him is going to bet on him being ready at year three or maybe you know, at the end of year two. I think earlier than that is mainly the, the standard stuff, you know, being a good rim protector, a pick and roll, Roman getting your offense there. And basically just be a head of limited role on offense and not the guy too close to defense bandwidth, you know, because... Another that's another negative in this example is he's drained the mid-range shot and the shot is looking quite well for a big man, but at the free throw line he's shooting 52% and it's not yeah. very good. And that's the part where he really needs to step his game up and work in that free throw shot. That's the part where in the article as well. What's really surprised me is that the shot is looking good, but the free throw shooting is, is horrible, you know. So he's not a good option to close a game with, and that's something that will hurt his draft stock some more because in the NBA the guys that you can close games with, especially in the playoffs, are very rare. Those guys are very hard to find. I think that's why Mark Williams, for example, is going to be at that lottery level yeah. in this draft class because he's able, he's shown in the tournament that he's perfect guy to close games with as a big man, you know, without giving up your main tactics or go small or things like that. That's the part where some of the negatives went uh, with uh, Khalifa Jam. Yeah, and I think that where we where you kind of have him drafted and where he might not even be a second round guy for me but I think if you're looking for undrafted talent to add to like maybe a summer league or G League roster I, I think Khalifa Jop is definitely worth um going and looking and seeing if he'd be interesting in doing that uh, I think that if you're taking him that late though we're looking at him in the undrafted free agency market you're not necessarily looking for that closer right like you're looking for a guy who potentially could come in and give you anywhere from like six to 12 minutes a night. Is yeah. that a role that you think that he could excel at? I think in the first year, yes, but I think eventually we'll get a bigger role than that, especially mainly because of his screening. And if he can really, you know, expand his game than being, you know, a drop coverage big man, you know, mm-hmm. show consistency with his conditioning, calling guys at the perimeter. I think he has a future in the NBA as a reliable back of big man and maybe some more after, you know, couple of years in NBA because that's the biggest part where I struggle with evaluating this big man is where are those guys five years down the stretch are they going to start are they keeping keeping him on the bench and maybe he's falling out of the league because big men like that come every year in the draft that's yep. where really the NBA today is really a tough place for the big man you know so you're either a good pick and roll defender or 
you got guys, got guys in the perimeter. If you want a really reliable future, where you're gonna say like Adebayo, I keep bringing up Adebayo, I don't know why, but if you want to have a long career in the NBA, as a he's starter, like the prototype big man though in the NBA, yeah. right? Like a guy who could guard one through five, tries to extend his range and can pass and rebound and defend. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense why you keep bringing him up. Yeah, he checks a lot of those boxes. And and I think the 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 last thing to come back to that that is a positive for shop. And this is something that I know Raphael has talked about multiple times on the podcast as well, is that the, these teams that these overseas clubs, they, they don't want to play guys who really give them chances to lose games or, or create yeah. a chance to win games. They play guys because these coaches want to be able to win. These organizations want to be able to win. So the fact that we have seen over the last few seasons, Jop, who is on a team that plays in the ACB, very tough league overseas. His playing time has increased. He's now what was up to 16 minutes per game, which is excellent to see him getting playing meaningful minutes and doing meaningful things on the court. I think Steven, that does play in your point about, can he come in and be a backup in the NBA? I think if he's playing 16 minutes in the ACB, I think he can absolutely handle eight to 10 minutes in the NBA, pick up a few, be, be a magnet for a few fouls, but at the same time also really bring that rebounding to the table, some of that finishing inside. If he can show off some of that footwork in the post, love hearing about that as well. And, and that really comes back to the potential point about him, right? I think that's why some of the ESPN yeah. guys are very high on him. He's he's only starting to blossom really in more of his offensive game now. And I think mm-hmm. if we can see improvement in certain areas, I mean, that that's what we talk about. I'm not just being a drafting prospect, but somebody who could share the floor with other players, potentially next year or, or another year down the line in the NBA. So he will be an interesting prospect to monitor as we move forward. You've done a good job, Erson, bringing really <laughs> positive points about the last Thank two you. guys we've talked about and have helped, you know, re-gear my mind a little bit on my evaluation process with them this last guy though i don't know if this is while we're laughing i I don't don't know if you're gonna do it for me man so this (laughs) this guy i'm i was actually excited to hear that erson brought this name up because before these last two days i had not re-dug back into his film this year um since since when we evaluated him for for the last draft cycle roko perkachin i had not dove back into his film so i was curious because i'd seen a lot of the buzz not a ton of people are like ranking him in their top 60s anymore. And we're talking about a player who I think, I think draft Twitter was like all, all aboard the top 20, all aboard super the hard. <laughs> I mean, we're talking through what I think Chuck had him in like his top five or top six or, or something like that. And I know uh, Bryce over at upside. So is right high on him. Like this is a guy who's taken like a, a really hard fall, yeah. at, at least as far as draft Twitter is concerned. You, you, I have not heard his name come up. I go back and I watch some of the film, the more recent film, Erison, those, those concerns that I had, they're still popping up, my friend. So you look at this guy, he's, first of all, he's built fantastically for a forward. He's 6'9", yep. 234 pounds. Dude's not just a brick house in the upper body. He's got, he's got some really beefy, strong legs as well. Like he, th- this man is built. He's ready to play in a professional league like the NBA. He plays for Sabona, does an excellent job um, with, with some of the responsibilities he has from a physical standpoint. But where it comes apart is that he's not a knockdown shooter. The shooting has been a question mark for him the last two years. The free throw percentage is still down. Matter of fact, you would take a look at his numbers. I'm not going to sit here and, and read off a lot of the numbers. I don't, I don't need to completely dog the guy. He's, he's a good prospect, but his production has decreased overall, like across the board, like every single category you look at, his production's gotten worse. That's not what you want to see from a prospect who could have possibly been in the draft, likely should have been in the draft last year. Now he withdrew his name and hopes to potentially raise his draft stock amongst NBA front offices and scouts and executives, not just guys like us on Twitter. That has not really worked out well for him. And the biggest thing, Erson, that I came back to, I'll be curious to get your thoughts on this. When I evaluated him last year, he seemed like he was much bigger, much stronger, and much faster than the competition he played against. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, th- this is great. This looks great on tape. But when we evaluate 
the types of players he's doing this against, it's not really impressing me that much, especially when you factor in how some of his perimeter skills um, are, are hit and miss. Some of the passing, well, he'll throw some amazing dart passes one trip down the court. He mm -hmm. will throw a rocket completely the other direction out of bounds um, uh, on the other play. So there's uh, there's some some spotty execution and, and, and decision making from him from that aspect. When you factor in how inconsistent some of those skills are and you put those up against the tape that we have from this year, where it seems like he's playing more physical, better competition, and he's not converting at the same rate, and his numbers are down, and he's struggling to be a more efficient finisher. Some of that touch that we were looking for from him last year, it's not quite there for him this year. And I, I don't know, I don't know what to do with him as a prospect, Harrison. Help me! I, I, I'm legitimately asking you to help me on this podcast. How should I value Roko Perkishin at this point? in the draft cycle, where, where should I have him on my board as a relation to where, where you have him? Why, why do you still want to believe? Well, the reason I still believe in him is if you look at this path, it's not been good, man. Yes. Putting out his name last year was the biggest mistake he could have made. I think even this year, the comparison to last year, last year, KK Kibono was his team. I think this year, that has changed. You know, they have another player, Omar Gegic. He's a couple of years old. He was also a promising European prospect a few years back. But he's really taking that team over. I think the, the injury that set him out for three months yep. also didn't help him at all. So it's basically the worst thing that can happen to a prospect has happened to him, you know. So, But if you look at this game, I think the free throw numbers, those aren't good, around 60%. And he's not covering those. The shot isn't looking good. The three-point shot he's shooting this year, about 33%. That's also not good. But he's... In his defense, what I do like is his shot selection. He's shooting about 30% of his attempts are from downtown. The rest is from inside. But the main thing that's really hurting him, in my opinion, is he's too reluctant. Man. He doesn't ask for the ball. He can make some plays off the bounce for others, but he doesn't do that to KK Kabona as well. I think if you look at him, he's more of you know the, the guy you don't see on the team. And he's not taking his spots to really show himself, you know, because he's a lot of player. He's a lot of he's a better player than he's shown today. Of course, he's for me it's easy to say, but the things I do like about him is is about the, the screening. He's not as good as a screener's job. I think he's a decent screener in European terms. He doesn't set himself apart, but he will be a better screener in the NBA compared to what the NBA forwards are, are on the dead end, you know, because if you look at his game, he doesn't really have a game to, you know, he's gonna be this in the NBA. That's the biggest. This, this, that's the biggest, the toughest part in this whole profile. But if you look at the game from A to Z, because if you look at uh, the finishing inside, he's a good pick and roll Roman. He gets, he does get his spots from pick and roll plays, and he does get downhill from off the bounce. But this doesn't really look quite convincing, you know. So especially this season, especially after injury, from what I've seen, of course you have some match fitness that doesn't really help his case he needs a lot of those more of those reps but the season is already at the end stage so that's another part that's not going to help him because if i say i've missed a second round pick at this moment i'm truly banking on the comparisons of sorry the potential from last year because last year i i, I totally believe he was a top 20 guy just like the rest of the draft twitter i think the top 10 that's where i had him at the beginning of the season and i was mainly banking on you know he's taking over the team again KK Kibona, Dario Saric played there. They had an excellent youth setup. And they were really competing for a, for the playoff spot in NBA in the ABA League, you know? And they are not in the playoff spot anymore. So the season is already over for them almost. But to come back to the point by Rocco Perkinson, what is the promising part in this game is that if you look at the, the average NBA forward today, most of those NBA forwards kind of are forced to do a bit of everything, you know, to, to really showcase themselves at the, at the better stage. For example, Brandon Ingram. He can play the one to the four. The role that Ingram had, I think that the role, that's what the role I, I had in mind for Perks. That's why I ranked him so high. Because he can he can make some pick and roll plays. He doesn't do it often. I think if you look at the assist numbers, he doesn't even have a, a one assist to turnover ratio. Well, because he doesn't get the reps, he doesn't get the ball, but he's not asking for it either. So I think it's more of a mentality standpoint for him rather than he's not skilled enough to play in the NBA. Because I think the NBA body is clearly there. The physical tools are there. I think the basketball IQ is already there on that guy as well. Because his father was a, was the creation 
a basketball league MVP before Rocco was born. And he's played in Russia, he played in Greece, he played in Turkey. So Rocco grew up at all different places and he was all the time with his dad at the training facilities. You know, so he, he witnessed several basketball philosophies in his whole youth. So that's definitely something that he brought in his whole youth development at KK Kibona. Because if you look at Croatia, he was one of the biggest prospects they had for a couple of years. And he still is, but the team where he's at, he's mostly used as a role player. And I think it's not representative to the role that he's going to get in the NBA because he doesn't do a lot of those things on the court anymore. It's mainly pick and roll plays. He's going to get to the rim. And his defense, I think the quickness, that's what teams are buying in with him. I think he's a decent quick player. He has some good lateral quickness as well. But at the post, his defense is not good. I think with 0.3 blocks per game, that's basically telling the whole story. And what I've seen is despite his NBA body, he has a tough time matching the physicality at the paint. You know, that's why the block numbers are still down. But I think in his defense, what's translatable to the NBA is he's very well against quicker players, against the more explosive players. He can really keep those guys in front of him and really contest good at the rim, you know. I think at the NBA, the perimeter defense for forwards, that's what the part where, you know, these guys are determined their success. If you don't have a plus well, you know, the defense is bad at the perimeter, I think that life is going to be really hard for you. But Rocco, really the quickness, that's what I'm banking on in his final stages before the NBA draft. He's a quick guy. I think the NBA combine is his last chance. Because if you look at, you know, the vertical, vertical, vertical jump, that's really good. As you said, he has some really strong legs as well. He can really. He's, he's, he's an Olympic athlete. Well. He literally looks yeah. like yeah. an Olympic athlete, which the, the background stuff that you brought up with his father, that, that makes 100% sense. Because he's, he's just take, take a look at look at him for two seconds, and you're like, holy cow, this, dude, this dude's ready to play. Yep. Yeah. He's really prepared for the game. But I think it's more of his mentality standpoint that's not helping his case at all. He's really reluctant in asking for the ball. He doesn't have a lot of usage. So that's something that's really going to either hurt him at the NBA or teams that see those things and oh, these, we're going to help this guy, we're going to fix this. Because we see that in the NBA draft process, well, guys who are actually better players but don't take the, the stage to showcase themselves. And I think in Europe, the toughest part to be in as a prospect is when you don't get a fair chance on the team. Because as you say, European teams play to win because losing means demotion to a lower league. Losing means losing television money. And the budgets in Europe are not comparable to the NBA by far. I think the G League budgets are more comparable to teams like KK Kibona. So they don't have a lot of money to operate with. That's why those teams really bank on those buyout fees, you know, that NBA teams pay to really help them, you know, you know cover their expenses. But KK Kibona is a real talent factory, man. They produce guys like this almost every year, but... Rocco Perkinson is a great athlete. I think the athleticism is what you buy with him. The quickness is what you buy with him. And I think the things that he does at the post, and I think the shot is also really good inside from the mid-range. He does, uh, I saw some, so earlier today, I saw some tape from, from him pulling off from mid-range, and the pull-up looks really clean, you know? Especially in the face-up game, you don't see a lot of those. Of course, Jabari Smith is the best example for that in compared to the face-up game. He's not nowhere near Jabari Smith, but I think if you look at prospects who are, you know, comfortable in the face-up game inside, I think Rocco Perkinson is right there with him. Not at the level of Jabari Smith, but I think the, the potential on the face-up game, especially with the pull-up jumpers, that's where you're going to get his value in the NBA as well. But overall, I think it's more of a mentality standpoint for him because he's way too reluctant to ask for a ball. I've seen several possessions where he's making soft ball plays and Nothing happens. He's getting an open look and maybe he get the ball because the point guard can't can pass on him this time. And he's shooting the three, it goes in or not, but he doesn't really get to his spots that good. That's something he really needs to work on if he wants to have a good future in the NBA. I do have a good closing question, Stephen. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask it at the end on, on Roko, but I got to let you hop in here with anything you got. Yeah, so I'm glad that Urson brought up – he brought up a lot of really good points about Roko. I feel like this, I just – This like, man has absolutely slayed us I, on our own podcast today. Holy I, shit. I, I, I was taken to school on Roko, but the one thing that I did know, and uh, people can choose whether or not to believe me, I knew about the injury, right? And when we were comparing about 
how he was viewed last season to this year. I think a lot of it has to do with the injury. So, Erson, if you're looking at drafting a guy, I, I think the, the point that you brought up about taking him in the second round based off of what we saw last year pre-injury and pre-role change uh, has a lot of, you know, credit to it. I think that a team might look at him and say, all right, this guy was viewed at, you know, kind of highly as a first round talent last season due to injury kind of fell uh, team kind of got away from him and maybe he's still playing his way back off of injury. I mean, it's not like these guys come back at a hundred percent when yeah. they come off of injury. Right. So um, due to his build, probably due to his competitive and may, excuse me, competitiveness and maybe some influence from his father as well, who we know is a, you know, former pro athlete and the, uh, the background that he has, maybe he was kind of pressured to come back a little bit sooner. Right. So maybe that has a little bit to do with it. Uh, but Urson, if he doesn't get drafted, and I think that we could all agree that that's a probability, you know, whether or not it happens or not, I think that we could agree that it's a probability. What do you think his path looks like, man? Like, do you think that he, that he tries to go back to KK Sabonia? Do you think that he tries his hand at maybe another league? Um, especially due to, you know, it looks like a role change happening with that team right now. So like, what are some of these options that might be available to him that some of our listeners may not be like super familiar with for a European or an overseas player like Roko Prakashan? That's an excellent question, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. I love that you brought it up because what you see with those NBA draft prospects who don't make it, they usually get not in the Euro League, but in the Euro Cup echelon, you know. So he's gonna to go to a team in another in another country that's you know competing for the playoffs. I think if you look at the Spanish league, the strongest domestic leagues outside the NBA, I think he's gonna play for the, the sixth or the seventh best team and have a good okay. role for them, you know. And maybe you know even lead that team because most of those guys eventually make the Euro League, despite you know being the real talented guys like Brookson is. They usually make the early at year three or year four. He's still very young because at 19 years old, you don't get a chance in the Euroleague at all, unless you're like Victor Van Biama or something. Right. Like that, you know? So so you, teams in the Euroleague don't play those guys because those guys really need to work themselves up from the bottom of the ladder, you know. So I think KK Capone is a very respectable team. The ABA league is not a strong league, but they're competing for the playoffs every year. They even won a championship in the year that Saric was there before he was, right. before he declared for the draft. They won the championship in that year. But overall, if you look at guys like that, if they go undrafted, they might try try their shot in the G League for the, in the summer league. Try to earn a camp deal somewhere else, and they sign eventually in Europe in a at a good team. You know, European teams always keep those guys open, keep a roster spot open for like the early. September days so they can sign a good player like that to start the season with but I think the Euro Cup the second tier second tier international league in Europe that's a perfect spot for him if he doesn't make the NBA because I think he can be you know a high not, not a team star but a second option on a team like that you know that they're competing at the high high clip in the Euro leagues actually in the Euro Cup for example Gran Canaria a team like mm -hmm. that or maybe a team like Rachel from Ulm, where Pedro Zugic is playing right now. You know, teams that are competing for the high playoff spot in their domestic league and also want to try their luck in the European competitions. I think he can eventually play in the Euro League for sure if he managed to, you know, keep working on his game and elevating slowly, you know, because I think 19 years old in, the, in Europe is very young and you don't get the chance, man, unless you're really, really good. And that's what's hurting your international prospects, in my opinion, evaluating for the and then for the draft. Wow. You know what, Stephen? I'm not even going to ask my closing question. I'm going to leave it there because you did an excellent <laughs> job with that one. That was... Well, thank man, you. We're very impressed by, by how deep we could go with that last question on him. So let's, let's leave that portion of the podcast there. We will close out this show by talking to Arison about his New York Knicks I, as well as Steven, I think want to know who he would love to be in a Knicks uniform with the lottery pick that they're going to have. I did, uh, I, I think I did an excellent job in drafting Johnny Davis to the Knicks when we yeah, did our mock draft podcast. That yeah. was, that to me, oh, excellent, excellent, perfect pick in, in my opinion for the Knicks. But my opinion doesn't matter to Knicks fans. They are passionate <laughs> for a reason. So Arison, who do you want the Knicks to take? 
Oh man, it's a really tough question because the Knicks they need a lot, man. They need the living <laughs> guard. They need some depth on the wing, even now with crimes and there, there, you know. And especially they need a center, man. I think the center position is where they're desperate. Oh, we just poo pooing Jericho Sims already. He's only been there for a year. <laughs> no, I think Jericho is a great backup center because I'm not impressed with Mitchell Robinson because he. I, I know you're not. NBA, I follow you no, on Twitter. No, no. I, you're not a. You are not a Mitchell Robinson supporter at no, all. No, no, that's an opinion. <laughs> Some people won't really take a have a good positive opinion to tell me about. You know, because Mitchell Robinson in four years of NBA, he doesn't really develop this game at all. He mm-hmm. entered the league as a lob threat. He was really good at guarding the perimeter. That was his main job with the Knicks. And in year four, he doesn't guard the perimeter anymore. He's same. He's still the same lob threat. I think the stocks, the box score stuffing is very nice, but Mitchell Robinson deserves a fair shot at another team, in my opinion, maybe the Charlotte Hornets. And mainly because I don't really have a high opinion about him is because he's not a good screener at all, man. The screens yeah. that he set is basically just forcing a guy to take a decision, no separation at all, just am I going over the screen or am I dropping the coverage? And that's basically been the story for four years. My personal preference is Jalen Durant. For the New okay. York Knicks. I think the New York Knicks development team has really been having a great, you know, development in the last couple of years, developing those guys. The Knicks really drafted very well two years ago with Obi Toppin, I think two years ago last year with Obi Toppin quickly, this year with Grimes and Miles McBride. Those four guys are going to be very high tier role players for the Knicks, but the Knicks need a new starting center. Man. I think if Jalen Duran and the Knicks get a little bit lucky in the, in the lottery with a top 10 pick, Jalen Duran is the perfect guy to pick because if he managed to fix his shot, that's something I know you're not really, you know, been too high on this season, Nathan. I think I totally agree <laughs> with you on that point because the shot isn't looking good with Duran at all, but he's an excellent screener in my opinion. He's an excellent pick and roll Roman. And if he really can get, you know, fix his shot, he has a long future with the Knicks. I think Jalen Duran is the first guy I want the, the Knicks to take this season. So if, if Jalen, I got two questions real quick, Nathan, yeah. um, and I'll give them to you both at once. Um, if you couldn't pick any of, like, th- just off the names that you gave us, the four names that you gave us, of those four, who would you most prefer in New York? Marjan Beauchamp. Marjan Beauchamp. Okay, that makes sense. And then, and then second question, if Jalen duran has gone and you really hate Mitchell Robinson this much, <laughs> do you entertain taking a Mark Williams? At twelve, if if you're staying like right around twelve, would you would you be comfortable taking Mark Williams that high? That was the just just but to jump in really quick. That that was going to be my follow up question to to what Erson said because listen, Matt Penny, friend of the program, we're gonna have him on the podcast again next week. He was watching Duke in the tournament. He just he put that tweet out there where he just like whispered in the tweet. He's like, "Is it time to start talking about Mark Williams versus Jalen Durant?" And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Matt, don't do it, man. Just, just don't I, I said do it. the let's, same thing. Don't. Let's not open that can of worms. <laughs> however, however, when I sit and I think about it with a more reasonable, clearer mind, I'm starting to see where people are going with the conversation. And we're talking about me going a complete 180 from where I was at with Mark Williams like two months yep. ago versus where I have him trending right now. So in answering Steven's questions as well, do you think the gap has really closed between those two guys? I think it does. I think the tournament, I'm not a big fan of evaluating the tournament in the guy's draft stock, but for Mark Williams, I'm making the, making the exception, you know, because in the tournament, what he's shown, especially with closing games with Duke, is incredible. He's a reliable NBA big man that I was talking about that's going to have a 15-year career based on what he does. You know, making scores out of dump offs, sitting there at the post with his defense, with his offense as a pick and roll Roman. I think Mark Williams really is a guy that I was high on him before the season started. I was solely dropping him in before the season was ex- coming to the end. And now I think I had him back in my first round. I had him, I think, in my 5.0 board at the 40s. And I have him in my top 20 again because he totally deserves it. And to come back at Steven's question, would I pick Mark Williams to the Knicks? I think, yes, he deserves to be picked that high. And I think, no, he doesn't. He's not a good fit for the Knicks because the Knicks are desperate for a guy that is either going to be a stretch big or is already a stretch big, you know, because the Knicks really rely on shooting. 
And I think the, the part about the rim protection is a lot of auto senders can offer that as well. And I'm not, you know, buying that Marks Williams is going to be a knockdown shooter one day. But he hit Maybe that he, he hit that like Dirk Nowitzki fadeaway jumper in the tournament, Urson. Come on now. What no, what did the agree, man just but... say? Don't don't hold the tournament so highly <laughs> in your evaluations. He you also said him, like two seconds. I did. He also said he's making an exception for Mark Williams. No, I'm making an exception because he has really shown that he can, despite being the center being in today's NBA, the least important part, it's, as it seems, because I t- truly believe the center is still the, the most important part, mainly because of the screening and uh, great separation for your shooters to help them with their spacing. But Mark Williams, to me, is if he goes to Hornets, man, that's, that's, a, that's a home pick it. for me. Everybody, Everybody loves, loves that pick. It. But the Knicks, I don't think it's going to be in Mark Williams' favor to go to the Knicks as much as I like him now. But I think the Knicks should get a, a guy that, you know, can potentially shoot. He, he shot that beautiful turn right for anyway. I totally agree. But did he then do that in the season? No, <laughs> this is one shot. This is one shot. I, I feel you. Yeah. Listen, I'll, I'll tell you what, man. So I, I've been doing a lot of work for our No Ceilings brethren, but behind the scenes of putting together some, some database stuff and trying to keep track of a whole bunch of different reports and tabs. And Steven's actually been doing a great job helping me out with some of that as well. Part of what I'm doing is I want to make sure I'm tracking as many big boards and mock drafts as possible. The thing that stood out to me the most about the mock drafts you know how many people are mocking Mark Williams to the New York Knicks? It's actually crazy. Like I, I, that didn't even cross my <laughs> mind. They've been doing like mock drafts, and I'm like, holy shit! Like, does it make sense? Is that is that what the Knicks need for some of these perimeter guys? Like, I didn't think so. But in hearing yourself talk about like you think the Knicks really need another starting center, and then you look at some of these mocks, and it's like. I guess I really just haven't watched enough Knicks basketball. I guess that's really what it comes down to. I'm, I'm just an uninformed scout at this point that doesn't know how to project these guys in a mock draft. I don't know, but that, that's why it was really interesting to hear some of your, some of your thoughts about where you would go with the pick and at least entertaining Mark Williams saying Jalen Duran as a Knicks fan, you're lining up with a lot of what I'm seeing on the media front in terms of what direction the Knicks should go. So I, I trust you're not opinion. a point guard. Not Ty Ty Washington. Not Ty Ty Washington. Not, not no, 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 not that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But with that being said, that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Erson, seriously, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. I just want to tell you again that you're doing excellent work on the fronts that you are. When Stephen and I were sitting oh, down talking it, about, we were talking about some guests that we definitely wanted to get on the podcast before the draft. And he, he brought up your name and I, I said, yes, within five seconds. Cause I know, I know yeah, thank you, man. you do. And I know what you're putting out on social media. So plug yourself one more time for my audience, specifically where they can find you, what kind of work you're doing. Make, make sure you plug yourself, man. Cause uh, my audience should definitely have eyes on everything you're doing. Well, first of all, gentlemen, thanks for having me on the pod again. I'm a loyal listener to the draft team podcast, I think for the whole draft season. And I, me being, you know, on the show today is your know, crown of my on my own work, you know. So and for the guests, you can find me at EDemir MBA and Twitter. That's E-D-E-M-I-R MBA. I tweet mostly about the NBA draft. I tweet almost about every rookie and sophomore in the NBA today. And I also tweet about the New York Knicks. So if you're interested in that, definitely give me a follow. And if you want to talk draft with me, definitely hook me up with the DMs. You know, I'm always open to talk to talk draft, be open to other opinions as well. And again, Nathan, Stephen, I, I love you two guys, man. Really, you guys are putting out so many good work, man. I think especially the whole No Ceilings team. So a whole shout out to everyone at No Ceilings for, you know, really taking over the spot, man. I think this season... Every player, I was talking to Stephen about this earlier today. <laughs> Every player has already been covered by you guys, you know. So as a RPL, I also said, you guys are an army, man, you know. So it's really tough competing with you guys, man. And it's all friendly competition, you know, because I think the one thing that I want to give a shout out to whole draft Twitter is we are a really close community. You know, everyone got yep. each other's backs. Everyone's helping each other out. And we have a lot of different opinions on and everyone's learning from each other, you know. So... Because I'm definitely learning a lot from you two guys. So big shout out to you, man. And thanks for having me on the pod. I really enjoyed talking some prospects with you guys. 
And I hope I uh, somehow convince you guys about uh, Marshall and Bochamp and other guys. No? Oh, I told you, you you, you slaughtered <laughs> us on our own podcast. It was it was actually spectacular. Everything you brought yeah. to to the forefront. We appreciate the the kind words for the rest of the No Stones brothers. Well, I, I I know we've written about a lot of guys. I'm the one who keeps track of all that stuff for us. So I I, I know we've been <laughs> almost every one of them. The, the solo. He's the one that makes us keep track of all these guys. Nathan's the one. <laughs> Nathan's the one cracking the whip behind the scenes. People think that Nathan's just this nice guy, but man, he's he's he really puts us to the fire with all the work that we pump out. Man, Nathan's a he he, he makes us work hard. We 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 go we go to war in no ceilings, man. This ain't this ain't a joke for us. We're trying to we're trying to cover the draft all year round, six days a week now, thanks to the weekend warrior Stephen Gillespie, and in, in ways that just hasn't really been done before. So that's that's been our mission, and part of that mission is. Also having guests on like yourself, Urs, and getting different viewpoints and, and bringing different people and prospects to the conversation. That That's really, in, in my opinion, what, what sets all of us apart. So thank you for helping in that. Steven, go ahead, man. Plug all your stuff. Yeah, so um, first off, just um, Urson, it's awesome to have you. Good to see you, man. You know that we've, we've been thank in conversation you. with each other for a while, dude. It's an absolute honor just to kind of see – that, you know, no things picking me up, Nathan picking me up, the co-host here. And then I'm also watching you at the same time, like being hand selected by Rafael Barlow, you know, early on in the year, he had you on his show and I was super, I think I might've been more excited for you than you were to be on the show, <laughs> but um, it was, it was awesome to just to kind of see you, you glow up this year and uh, happy to have you on the show, man. But uh, anybody who wants to follow me, they can do so on Twitter at Stephen G hoops. That's Stephen with the P H G hoops. Um, you can also read all my written work. I just dropped a uh, Weekend Warrior this past Sunday where we featured, you know, Keon Ellis as a uh, no-brainer to me as an NBA player because of the skill set that he has as a 3 and D prospect. Like, everybody needs that type of player. So if you want to learn more about him and kind of read my case for him, that's at nocealingsnba.com. I got another prospect that I am going to be writing about for this upcoming Sunday. I don't know if I'm allowed to name drop names here on the show, but if you're curious, it's about a uh, – a very good point guard who has a really good shot of turning some heads in the NBA next season. So just kind of a little teaser there. And then um, please, you know, Nathan, I know he's going to plug it as well, but everybody who's listening, uh, it truly means the world to Nathan and I, uh, the support that you guys have given our platform, it truly means a lot to us. So thank you everyone for listening, you know, please like share, subscribe, rate and review all that fun stuff. And we'll keep the, the amazing content and great guests like Urson coming as the season as draft season really is starting to kick off now yeah the mock draft podcast that, that we just released is skyrocketing absolutely hot uh, on the podcast yeah. market that that that's not me and steven that that's maxwell we, we have maxwell 100 percent maxwell maxwell tore it up man he was he, he he's great i'm so glad we have him in no ceilings as well but yes please Follow us on Twitter at No Ceilings NBA. Make sure you are subscribed, noceilingsnba.com. As Steven talked about with his key on LSP, so it was very well done. You can also read what I just put up today. Um, when you're listening to this podcast, it, it will be on, on Wednesday, but you, you got two days. Oh, awesome work, it, Nathan. Awesome work. If you, haven't, if you haven't read it by, by the time you hear this podcast, Shane Sharp, I put up words that – that was a really hard piece as I was telling Urson. He he was he was giving me a little love before we started recording the show. That that was a really tough piece to write. We just don't have a lot of film to go on, but being the mystery man that he is, that's part of the intrigue, right? That's why an NBA team might want to reach for the stars and, and draft him as high as they ultimately might. I, I I'm toying with having him top five on my board. And wouldn't when, be surprised. What once you dive down the rabbit hole, it's really hard to to bring yourself back to the surface. So um, definitely go make sure you read that, get some of my thoughts with that and make sure you're following me on Twitter at draft deeper, subscribe to the draft deeper podcast, wherever you get your podcast, Apple podcast, Spotify, YouTube, stay tuned later this week. So, so thrilled to have the next guest. We're going to be talking with CJ Moore from the athletic. We're going to bring him yeah. in and talk about Kansas basketball. They won the, I already wanted to have him on first of all, because of the incredible work that he does for the athletic he wrote up two beautiful profiles on Ochai Abaji and Christian Brown earlier in the year but we got to talk to him about the championship those guys so he's going to be an excellent resource for us to have on the podcast and then next week we're just going to keep cooking Matt Penny Matt Babcock they're making their return to the draft deeper platform we're we're, we're on a roll this April and we're, we're not going to slow down it's, yep. it's we're in the thick of it now so definitely make sure you stay tuned 
But until then, thank you all again for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.